Homo, homo sapiens have plus or minus 2% Neanderthal genes, therefore indicating crossbreeding. Why, why are Neanderthals considered a separate species? That's a very good question. It's one I will address, um, hopefully more specifically, in this lecture. Uh, so I'll just briefly say that uh, in any definition, whether it's of life, what life is, or whatever uh, species is, um, I think it's important to realize for species, it's not a hard defined definition. Normally, we do define it as those animals that are able to procreate and have viable offspring. But there are cases where, um, as I mentioned, closely related species can and do hybridize. Um, but I would argue that although we might have a few percent Neanderthal in us, it's not that, the, that we are Neanderthals, it's just we have a portion of their DNA, and that we uh, remain a separate distinct species from them, including the fact that it wasn't everybody who got Neanderthal DNA. Sub-Saharan Africans did not, because they were left behind in Africa, and Neanderthals didn't come down to Africa. Uh, of course, eventually, people came to Africa like us, who did have Neanderthal DNA, and some of that will be spread through the general population. But as a distinct species, Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis are really distinct species, even though they could interbreed. So it's, it's just a little bit more of a soft definition of species instead of a hard definition. OK, also relevant to Neanderthals, did they have bigger brains? Uh, yes, they may have actually had bigger brains than Homo sapiens, although, as I mentioned, we don't have a lot of skulls well enough preserved to really get a hard estimate on that. But certainly their brains were as big, perhaps bigger than ours. But I think one could argue that they were perhaps uh, differently structured. And I'll maybe talk a little bit to that as well. Uh, did they die out? Uh, or assimilated by, um, were they wiped out or assimilated by Homo sapiens? Well, this comes back to the interbreeding. So in some sense, Neanderthals do live on to some extent in the sense that some of their genes have live on in us. But as a species, again, I would argue that they've become extinct. Now, did we do, did we do them in? Well, we cer our arrivals certainly didn't do them any favors. Uh, they may have already been in decline, some people argue that. But there is a very, as I'll show today, there's a very clear association with the arrival of Homo sapiens, well, modern behaviorally Homo sapiens in Europe, and the demise or extinction of Neanderthals. And then there was a question here about Florus man. Uh, I did mention that briefly. I'll mention that briefly again today. I don't have time to go into that. Some people know him as the Hobbit about one meter high, a homo sapien species, but in a dwarf form. Uh, believed probably to be related to what's called island dwarfism. And it happens to other animals as well. So the island on which the homo floriensis lived also had elephants, Asian elephants, that were also miniature. So it was like everything went smaller to fit the island. Um, seafood, uh, many middens, some of them contain seal bones. There are many middens on the coastal areas, and if you walk along the coast and you see a big heap of limpet shells or mussel shells, chances are that it could very well be a midden. That would be the refuse dump of the shellfish after people ate the, the meat inside. Um, then the question is, is it true that we cannot live on seafood alone? Uh, I'm not aware of that. I think you could live on seafood alone um, because seafood is so diverse. If you think of all the algae and all the different aspects of seafood, I think you could probably live on that alone uh, and probably be quite all right. In other words, you don't need animal, terrestrial animal fat in your diet. Um, after all, we have, uh, like vegans, uh, they survive uh, fine. And that's a good point about diet. The human body is incredibly adaptive to whatever food is available. And although you might suffer from certain nutrient deficiencies, like iodine that I mentioned yesterday, 
as long as you have some form of food, particularly after your thousandth day of existence, you'll probably be all right. But as a, your first thousand days are critical in terms of your nutrition uh, as a growing uh, person. Okay, and finally, uh, why did our predecessors move out of Africa? Well, in fact, my point was our predecessor species didn't move out of Africa. Homo homo erectus did, and Homo heidelbergensis did. But our predecessor species, there's no evidence that they made an exit. Why exactly is not clear. And then, of course, our group, uh, Homo sapiens, made exits, and I'll talk about those in more detail today. Um, Is it possible that early species resident in southern and western Cape moved so far north as to leave the continent? Okay, I'll speak of that, of how we actually left also today. I think that was all the questions. Uh, and then uh, we'll carry on with uh, today's lecture. Okay, so just to get a brief recap of yesterday, what I tried to get across, I hope I was successful, but the basic idea there in lecture three was that um, we may have speciated on the south coast of South Africa uh, as a result of our predecessor species living there uh, being under strain because here's the coastal plain here hemmed in by the uh, mountains of the Cape Fold Belt and here is this expansive coastal plain that would have been exposed the Breeder River would have flowed out here. The Alfard Banks would have been a low rise of hills. And here's the Goritz River. So you would have had this huge expansion. But conversely, <coughs> our predecessor living there, <coughs> excuse me, would have been under a lot of pressure when sea levels started to rise rapidly uh, by the reduction of a land that they could live on. And if they were hemmed in by the mountains, it would have put them under a lot of pressure to find other ways to get the food that they needed to exist at those higher population densities. And I said that um, that was why we proposed that the, um, under that pressure, they may have gone to the trouble to go to the sea, to find seafood, to realize that it was actually pretty dang tasty and incredibly nutritious. They wouldn't have known that, but they would have known it as they uh, had generation after generation a very healthy people. And in that way, through the incorporation of shellfish and um, beached whales, they would have <coughs> possibly diverged through that diet towards uh, a ho homo sapiens. And that would constitute a speciation event. And evidence from the Pinnacle Point cave shown here, Pinnacle Point's a very fancy golf estate. There's a, a link there of the golf course. Uh, you actually uh, tee off over here and you hit your golf ball. I've never go golfed there, but you hit your golf ball across the way. But underneath there, that fairway, are these caves. And that's where the earliest evidence for a marine diet comes from, uh, fossil shells of the Perinaparina, the, the brown mussel, and so, uh, as well as the shells of the barnacles I mentioned for whales. And that's 164,000 years ago. So unfortunately, there haven't been any human fossils found there. So we don't, in fact, know who was eating that seafood, but presumably it was either our predecessor or our species, Homo sapiens, sapiens that had then evolved and were actively eating seafood by this time. OK, so that's, that's what we talked about yesterday. Now I want to carry on. Uh, and now in lecture four with the title Acquiring Culture and Glowing, Co Going Global. And so um, I ended last <clears throat> lecture with the question, if we speciated smart, and I believe we did, in other words, when Homo sapiens evolved, the very first Homo sapiens, they had a brain that was basically the same as yours and mine, okay, more or less, as far as we can tell, um, although that's debated, but that's what I personally believe. If that's the case, um, then why was it so long uh, in terms of developing what we term modern human behaviors and cultures? Uh, and I'll come back to exactly what that is uh, as the lecture goes on. But it included things like um, shell bead jewelry, uh, abstract engravings on ochre, 
uh, and various other features, which I'll talk more uh, specifically about just now, the gap is, say, roughly 100,000 years. If our species had arrived, certainly by 160, perhaps somewhat before, a modern-day hunter-gatherer culture like the San of South Africa, say, for example, that cultural level of material culture and abstract thought and language and everything else appears to have arrived by about 70,000 years ago, at least in southern Africa. So that's quite a gap. That's about a 100,000 year gap between when we speciated and when we acquired many of the characteristics that we think of when we think of modern humans. So I'm going to explore a little bit about why was there that delay. Uh, and the nutshell here is that although we speciated more or less the same brain as we have today, modern human culture took time to evolve just like everything takes time. And I'm going to argue in parallel with what I argued yesterday that that cultural evolution was accelerated again at the northern and southern tips of Africa, primarily because these groups were small, isolated, and under greater selective pressure. And under those conditions, they um, developed modern uh, cultural items that we understand today. Then the second part of this lecture, uh, and it's related to the first, because what I would argue is that it wasn't until our, spe our species did leave Africa before it became culturally modern. In other words, between 160 and 70, there were exoduses out of Africa of our species. But those groups who left did not have modern cultural behavior with them yet, because it hadn't evolved completely yet until 70. So it was only after our species had developed a material culture commensurate with modern day hunter-gatherers, the son of South Africa, for example, and the Sahara greened, that our species was able to successfully expand globally. Okay? So although we had these earlier exoduses, they were not particularly successful, or they don't appear from the archaeological record to have been successful, because, for example, the Neanderthals lived through them, the Denisovans survived through them. They may have uh, been coexisting with some anatomically modern humans, but those early exoduses didn't wipe out or displace those other groups the way we did later with this culture. So those are the two main themes I want to address. I'll start with this uh, first point here about the long, slow cultural evolution among uh, our species, and then why that was critical uh, in allowing for this rapid, very rapid uh, exodus and really conquering of the world in the sense that it drove uh, many other species, not only our cousins, but many large animals to extinction. OK, so let's start by asking, uh, what do we know about material culture? And that, remember, unfortunately, we don't know how people behaved early on, right? Because we don't have videotapes of them having dinner together or whatever. We don't know how they behave. But we know we can infer how they behave from cultural items that are left. And cultural items are preservational bias towards stone tools simply because stone tools are hard. And they're very, once you've made one, it doesn't matter if you've lost it or you die, your stone tool is going to last a lot longer than you because many of them are made of quartz, which is a very stable mineral, and they'll endure for a very long time. And that's a nice thing because it means that we can find these artifacts. And I mentioned earlier the oldest known stone artifacts are these Lomequian, uh, Lomequian uh, from uh, East Africa that date to 3.2, just a long time ago, 3.2 million years ago. And then I said <clears throat> those were replaced by Oldowan type stone tools. These are the cores of them at 2.6 starting. And then starting from about 1.9, we get this very distinctive Acheulean hand tool, hand axe, that was um, associated with the arrival of Homo erectus. Now, if you look at those stone tools, can you appreciate that some are better looking than others? 
And which one do you think is the nicest looking? In other words, if you were to walk in on a path and you came across these stones, which one are you most likely to be attracted to and actually bend over and pick up? This one, right? And why is that? Well, I would argue that's because of symmetry, all right? You can see that this is, I mean, functionally, they'll all pretty much do the same job. If you have the bone of a hippo and you want to get the fatty marrow out of the bone because you're hungry, you can take any one of these and crack it with these hard stones and you can suck the marrow out. But functionally, they're all similar, but aesthetically, they're different. And the difference here is that this stone tool, this hand axe, very characteristic hand axe, has symmetry. So what do we mean by symmetry? And why does symmetry matter to us? Well, symmetry reflects the fact that there's a mirror image, right? And we're familiar with this type of symmetry because the human body, if you cut a line through it, is symmetrical, by what we say bilaterally symmetrical, uh, in that not in terms of your internal organs, but in terms of your body plan, you have this bilateral symmetry, as does your face. And remember way back in the first lecture when I talked about the Cambrian explosion and all those animal groups came out of the Cambrian. Almost all of them are what we call bilaterians, which means that most animals alive today share this bilateral symmetry. And it's believed to be important to us because we use it, perhaps subconsciously, as a way of um, understanding someone's beauty or their reproductive fitness or their health or other aspects about that person. And that's why a lot of people go to great lengths with uh, facial makeup or with jewelry or with hairstyle to have a symm as symmetrical looking a face as possible. Turns out symmetry is really important. So, and when I speculate in the book, although some people would argue against this or would, ar would, would not agree with me, I, I still like, I, I feel like it's significant. If we look at this hand axe, for example, now this one actually dates from about 900,000 years ago. So it was near the uh, middle of the Homo erectus time period. But it has a beautiful symmetry. And this shows you the one side, the reverse side, and this shows you how thin it is, tapered. Now, to my eye, that's basically a piece of sculpture. And I think quite a beautiful piece of sculpture, the way it's been uh, chipped away to give this very distinctive bilateral symmetry. OK, they're not exactly mirror images of each other, but they're pretty damn close. And there's a symmetry line down the center of it, too, that's about the same thickness on either side. Now, functionally, that may be helped with the weight of it and the evenness and the use of it to make it easier to use. But I would argue that for many hand axes, that was intentionally done to make them look beautiful. Uh, and you can perhaps speculate even more that if we take that shape and overlay it on the skull or the reconstructed image of Homo erectus, it mimics the shape of the human head. And in that way, because in fact, there are localities in Kenya, for example, with many, many hand axes, some of which never appear to have even been used as a tool. So the question is, why were they made? And I don't think it's too outrageous to suggest that some of them may have been made simply because they're beautiful uh, pieces of sculpture and maybe were able to reflect uh, the maker's ability, mental ability, to think of a, that symmetry and that form and to chip it out of stone. So it could have been a way for males to attract females or vice versa, who knows. That's quite speculative, but I think it's kind of intriguing, so I thought I'd mention it. Okay, besides stone tools, we also know about paint, body paint. As I mentioned earlier, this is use of ochre. This is the himba in Namibia, which use it to an extreme. Uh, but it's also um, likely that it was used in the past. 
And ochre, here's some stones here from Pinnacle Point, also dating from the same layers as the oldest seafood supper at about 164,000 years ago. And what's, it's, what's wonderful about ochre is it's also a stone. It's an iron oxide, like rust. So you, you can grind it into a powder, and it has a lot of color, red color, which, again, symbolically is important to us. We like red. It's very eye-catching, maybe because we have red blood, maybe because it's just the way our eyes work. Who knows? But red is very distinctive color, and we're attracted to it. And because this iron oxide is a fairly durable rock, it also survives long periods uh, of preservation. So <clears throat> one thing that's distinctive is, remember, this ochre was already being used by a predecessor. But there isn't a lot of it in the rock record, or the archaeological record at that time. There's a large increase in the use of ochre starting from about 160,000 years ago until it becomes very common. And the other interesting thing is people appear to have gone out of their way to try to select the reddest forms, or in some cases the yellowest form of ochre for use. Um, and in some cases they would have heated it to enhance the red color. And they, we know they also heated a rock called silcrete, which not only turned it, in some cases, redder, but also made it easier to flake and make better tools. And I referred to that as pyrotechnology. And that was one of the early forms of technical improvement that was done by our species quite early on, because pyrotechnology and abundant ochre is also occurring along with seashells at 164. Then if we go not too far down the coast to Blombos Cave, this is the interior looking out to sea. This is Christopher Henschelwood doing an excavation there as the archaeologist. And what he found, his group found there, were these amazing uh, ochre processing toolkits. Uh, so at 164,000 and 100 kilometers away, we have the ochre, ground ochre. Here we have the actual assemblage of a processing toolkit. Now, this is 100,000 years old. Uh, so there's a 60,000 year difference here. But this is the abalone shale, which most of you, I think, are familiar with. It is perforated, but it makes for a perfect natural bowl, right? If you uh, see them on the beach, uh, they're a perfect bowl. Pieces of charcoal were found with it, pieces of ochre, grinding stone, and some bones probably ground to get the marrow, which is fat. So fat's a very good thing to mix with the ochre to put on your skin uh, to paint yourself red. So that's quite an amazing find, and I think it shows that <clears throat> our species was really into body paint. Uh, and that was really important because it's extremely uh, relate. it's really related to um, sense of adornment, self-adornment, which all humans, of course, do today in all cultures. It's a universal human behavior. And although it had early starts, perhaps in our predecessor, it really blossoms uh, with our species uh, as evidence from the archaeological sites. Other evidence of early behavior would be burial of our dead. Um, there have been recent arguments around Homo naledi. Some of you may have read about that discovery by Lee Berger um, up in Hauteng, but uh, that's debated. But this is clearly a burial of a human skull here and bones, and this is an antler horn. This is from that Kafez site in Israel from about 130 to 100,000 years ago. Uh, and they were clearly burying their dead. I also mentioned that the Herto site at 160,000 years ago, there are these polished, defleshed uh, adolescent skulls that some people interpret to be involving mortuary practice. So the other, and that there's really outside of Homo naledi, there's no real arguments for uh, burial of our dead. And that's another human universal. Every culture on earth today has some form of dis disposing of their dead through a ritual practice. It's highly variable in how that's done, but every group has that. The other thing that then becomes uh, evident in the archaeological record 
at least within the Maghreb to the north up here, the Levant uh, here in the Middle East and in Southern Africa is shell jewelry. So these, for example, are purposely bored holes within small tick shells, they're about a centimeter or two in size. Um, they are found in abundance uh, and they put a hole in there and you can tell by the wear patterns on some of these holes that they were strung, probably by animal, animal sinew or some other type of cord, they were strung and many of them, and these as well, have ochre staining on them. So either they were ochre stained intentionally to make them a different color or by rubbing against the skin as they were worn, they, they took up this color. And in this case, we have glycerum, glyceramus shells. Um, these are bivalves that um, would not have been collected for food, nor would these. These are too small to have enough food to bother with to eat. And these also wouldn't have been collected for food because they live in water too deep. Uh, but their shells occasionally wash up on the beach. And people purposely collected these. They drilled a hole in the umbo, again, probably to string them around their neck to wear as jewelry. In South Africa, we get the same genus, not the same species of Glyceramus. This is the fossil one. Here's a fresh modern one. And these, interestingly, do not have a hole. So they may not have been worn as jewelry, but they might have been kept as keepsake items as a, as a shell. And what's interesting, uh, and you'll see that this, I'll use this to try to reinforce my arguments yesterday. If you look at where shell jewelry is preserved, at least, it's in these three locations. Um, there is certainly a lot of cultural artifacts throughout the rest of Africa, in terms of stone tools, in terms of ochre. But as of yet, uh, the earliest shell jewelry and the earliest um, engraved material of symbolic items, which I'll mention, are really occurring exclusively in these locations. And that is either partly a factor, factor of preservation, perhaps these sites just happen to have better preservation than the rest of the areas, or it implies that those are where the locations were that they were first uh, developed. And you can see these are all somewhat younger. So these are 70 to 85, 90 to 130, 70 to 80,000. So more or less contemporane contemporaneously they developed. And of course, the, this desert here and this distance here was simply too great for them to have had this as a shared cultural phenomenon. In other words, it was independently developed in three separate places by early members of our species, Homo sapiens, which suggests that it's simply how our brain was wired and capable of that shell jewelry came about. And interestingly, that they picked not the same species, because these species of tick shells and glyceramus don't exist over that huge range, but they're the same genus and different species, quite similar looking. So it's intriguing to think about why they picked this particular Nasarius genus for its tick shell uh, bee jewelry and glyceramus. And I talk about that a little bit in the book, but I won't, I won't go into that now. The other a very interesting find at these sites is engravings. Uh, and the famous one that you've probably all seen of, heard of is this one from Blombos that Christopher Henshelwood found with these X-like marks uh, here that is a drawing of the actual engravings. And here's the, another piece here. And this is another uh, piece of engraved ochre found from Clossie's River, which is further to the east. And there's m several others. I don't show them all here. Uh, they are all pictured in my book, but uh, they're quite abundant. And these are occurring between 70 and 100,000 years ago. And they were thought at the time to be the earliest evidence of writing, if you will. But interestingly, on the island of Java, uh, dated at 450,000, they found this fresh water clam. This isn't a seawater marine species. This is a freshwater species. And they found these engravings on it associated with our old friend, 
Homo erectus. Now, Homo erectus at this time, that was one of the last holdouts of Homo erectus before they finally completely went extinct. Um, in Java and parts of China, Homo erectus managed to survive until maybe 300,000 years ago. Uh, and in one of their last holdouts, these engravings have been found. And this would perhaps reinforce the idea of those hand axes being, having a lot of symbolism with them, with their symmetry, uh, if they in fact were intentionally in making engravings on shells. Now, what any of these engravings mean, nobody knows. Uh, what sort of abstract thoughts they may have been having that inspired them to make them uh, is not clear. But they are interpreted to be intentional markings made for some reason. It might have been doodling, who knows. But they were not accidental. They were not just happened to happen that way. They are actual intentional markings on stone. We see them also on ostrich egg shells. Now these are, you know, of course you have a whole egg, big egg of an ostrich. These, you can see again, these markings. These are from uh, Clip Drift Shelter, which is on the south coast. Um, and they also occur at Deep Cliff on the west coast. And you can see that they're distinctively marked with uh, engravings. And we know that modern day sawn hunters will plant, or not plant, but uh, bury water filled, uh, emptied eggshells that are then filled with water and buried in sand uh, as water resources in dry areas such as the West Coast. So the implication is that at 66 to 59,000 years ago, our ancestors were also using emptied eggshells as containers, water canteens, for um, perhaps running down game in the heat of the day, uh, which was an effective way to hunt. Because we, as endurance runners who can sweat, we run marathons, right, after all, so could our ancestors if they needed to. And they could run game down to heat exhaustion until the animal collapsed and then just slit its throat, and, it, and then there was supper. Also about this time, 77 to 71,000 years ago, you get these truly exquisite lancelet or foliate points. They have been worked on both sides, and they've been used by, produced by a very special type of flaking called pressure flaking that allows for these very fine points to be developed. And again, I would argue that these are not only functional, you can see if you put these adhered these on the end of a long stick, you'd have a pretty good spear, but they're beautiful. And I am sure that if you were walking on a trail and you found one and saw one of these on the ground, you would definitely pick it up because you would be attracted to it immediately as, wow, that is beautiful. And they are. So I think there's a lot of symbolism and aesthetic beauty in addition to function. You can make a sharp pointed rock and put it on the end of a stick. It doesn't have to look beautiful and still be effective. Or you can make things like this, which are exceptional. And perhaps these would then even have been traded in times of hardship for their beauty as much as their function. And then late, slightly later than this, this is, by the way, this is called the still bay industry, these beautiful points. And interestingly, I just make a quick aside. These were first described <clears throat> from what's called the Gravettian in Europe. That dates to about 50,000 years later than this and was thought to be the epitome of stone tool making in Europe by our species. And it was only later that South Africa and Africa in general, these much older, just as exquisite landslip points were formed, found. So the argument, and I'll come back to this theme a little bit later, is that many of the early features were first found in Europe and thought to be attributed to European homo sapiens by European archaeologists. And it took a long time and a lot of more research before people realized, hey, wait a minute, these are actually occurring in Africa 50,000 years earlier. So guess what? Guess where they came from? They came from Africa, and they only later moved into Europe, which is what we'll talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> 
Then the next development after the still bay is the Howison's port. It's the microlithic stone tools. These are a series of them from Sabudu Cave, which is located north of Durban on the east coast. And these don't look as pretty, right? <laughs> They're much smaller, hence the name microlithic. They're smaller, and you can see they're sort of crescent. Many of them are crescent-shaped with back tools, and uh, these also present very sharp edges. So at first glance, you might sort of think, well, that doesn't really look like an improvement from these guys. But these are big. Okay, there's a centimeter scale there. You can see these are big uh, spear points. These are tiny. But by virtue of being small, they can be assembled into a far more greater variety of tools, depending on the job at hand. So if you want to make a harpoon type arrow with a number of these in a, in a row to better penetrate hide, uh, you can do that. If you want to make a single one in a certain orientation to use as a trimming knife, you can do that too. So the advantage of the microlithic tools is that by being small and versatile, the amount of armatures you could make and the different types of tools you could make was greatly improved. So these, in fact, were a huge step forward. And we know that they were the first armatures of bow and arrow, uh, and shown here, which was extremely important as another form of projectile hunting in addition to the thrown javelin spear, which we mentioned our predecessor species had already developed. But the really new one that we developed as our species was the bow and arrow, which is interesting because it's a compound tool. After all, you have to make both the arrow and you have to make the bow and then know how to use them together to have it be effective. So we call that a compound tool, and that was uh, required more sort of mental steps, if you will, in terms of how that would work. And the evidence for this comes from actually micro studies, microanalysis of these microlithic stone tools. And you can see that there are distinctive fractures along the cutting edge or the impact edge. And people have made these themselves, shot them at carcasses of a sheep or something. And they can generate the same distinctive impact structures uh, that appear on these fossil ones. So the implication is that these were also shot as arrows from a bow. And on the back side of them, they have this residual mastic. Mastic is essentially the glue, some of which was the iron oxide. Um, ochre was also used as part of the adhesive for attaching this to the um, rod of the, of the arrow. So um, what we observe then is that just to summarize that um, cultural innovative period, our species was certainly had arrived by some time in here. This is 200,000 years ago. This is today. So this is the last 200,000 years. And this, I hope by now you recognize as our interglacial, glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial today. Okay? This is our major climate shifts globally. And our species would have emerged perhaps from the south coast, perhaps from uh, the Ethiopian highlands, wherever they emerged from and spread throughout Africa by certainly 160,000 years ago. Um, and the indications are that we have very little record from this glacial maximum here, perhaps because our species was under tremendous stress and maybe even skirting on the edge of extinction Itself, but it managed to survive. And then with the rapid melting of the ice, rapid increase in sea level, and much warmer, wetter climates, things got a lot better in this uh, period here. And this is when the first exodus of Homo sapiens occurred out of Africa at about 130,000 years ago. That's what those fossils and those shell beads were doing in the Levant in Israel is that uh, our species had left at that stage. Um, that was the initial leaving. Then there are these interesting climatic fluctuations in here throughout this um, period. And then it got quite cold again, warmed up a bit again, 
and then got very cold, and then we've come back to our modern day here, where we have actually quite a nice uh, global climate. Now, <clears throat> um, it was in this period between about 120 and 80, 70,000 years ago that much of that innovative aspects I just showed you took place, okay? Uh, the making of those stone tools, the making of shell jewelry, the engraving of the ochre, that all occurred within this uh, stage five of this interglacial period here through to the uh, glacial stage four. And throughout Africa, there were very distinctive stone tool cultures that evolved. Um, as I mentioned, they weren't just in the southern and northern tips. Um, but certain uh, stone tools uh, were distinctive to North Africa, and certain ones were distinctive, like the um, microliths first appeared, as far as we know, in South Africa. So the argument will go again a bit like what we talked about yesterday, and that is during the glacial, groups were isolated and they developed different stone tools, different symbolic items, depending on the selective pressures at that time. And then they were uh, perhaps mixed and different cultures uh, migrated to different areas and so forth. Uh, and so Again, we can use the same arguments I made yesterday that in addition to biological evolution being in these isolated separate groups, you can also, of course, have cultural evolution different in those different settings. And what I would argue based on at least the archaeological record that we have is that the Maghreb and the southern coast of South Africa and the west coast, the coastal region of South Africa, were particularly rich in the earliest innovation, innovative material culture that is so important in defining uh, modern culturally modern humans. And this, this diagram just quickly tries to summarize that. So uh, from the Levant, we had the early burials, uh, and we had some shell jewelry. But then, oddly, in the Levant, in the Middle East, anatomically, our species appears to locally go extinct. They die out at about um, 80,000 years ago. They may have persisted in places like China, and people have argued that the Homo sapiens migrated as far east as China, but they never amounted to much. Okay? Those early exoduses happened, there's evidence of them, but they never amounted to much. Most of them died out, as far as we can tell. Then in the Maghreb, you have um, these Aterian tools with the tanged points here. And these are also quite small and potentially may have been used as arrowheads, but no one's done the similar study to show the impact structures or the residue on those. In the uh, East African Rift Valley, we had the perhaps death rituals associated with the hair toe skull. We had a lot of ochre use. But it was in southern coastal plains, southern Africa, that we see the earliest seafood diet. We see the earliest use of pyrotechnology. We see the earliest um, evidence of extensive ochre use in terms of a toolkit. We see the collection of keepsake shells as well as shell jewelry. Bone points, which I didn't mention, first appear in southern Africa. The still bay points, the microlithic points, the engraved ochre, the engraved ostrich egg shell, presumably for use as water containers. So the, the record is most surely biased in some respects. But even considering that, it's quite alarming how much cultural innovation was happening on our south coast during this critical period of around 100 uh, to uh, 70,000 years ago. And whether that was ex going to elsewhere in Africa or not, we simply don't have the record to know that. It was certainly occurring independently to some extent in the Maghreb, but that was definitely not in communication with the South Coast. Um, so these were independent developments. <coughs> and such that by 70, 60,000 years ago, truly what I think we could call 
equivalent to the modern hunter-gatherers had, evolved, had culturally evolved, okay? So the San, or Bushmen, however you want to call them, were, their cultural was pretty much established by that time. And that was important because once that cultural element had devolved, if you had bow and arrows, if you had abstract thought around engravings, whatever they meant, if, uh, if you had the uh, use of shell jewelry and that had symbolic meaning, if you had all those things, you could then, when the South Coast opened up and was no longer isolated, of course, you could spread out into the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. But ultimately, they were limited in how far north they could go by the very strong desert barrier of the Sahara. Um, and so what I would argue is that the reason we had a delay in terms of when our species successfully left Africa is because it first depended on becoming culturally sophisticated, which simply took time and uh, innovative cultural items to be um, incorporated. And secondly, it required an opening up climatically of Sahara to allow an exit out, as it had in the past for our predecessors. Now, some have argued that humans may have crossed here, very thin, narrow point at the southern end of the Red Sea. But even at the glacial maxima, there's still a seaway there. In other words, it would require building boats or some sort of raft to cross over. As before, the only land bridge, and the Straits of Gibraltar as well, as I mentioned, there was always a sea everywhere separating Africa from Eurasia, except for the Sinai Peninsula. That's always been the main land bridge. And <clears throat> when we look at speleothem records, this is a carbonate deposit that forms in caves. This one's from Israel, from a Negev desert where it's very dry. We see isotopic evidence for when there may have been greening of the Sahara. So as I mentioned, we crossed over 130 to 120,000 years ago with that greening our species, and we may have crossed over at 110 to 100 and 90 to 80. But all of those potential earlier crossings were without the innovative cultural items equivalent to a modern hunter-gatherer, which meant they were probably not going to be successful against Neanderthals and Denisovans who had been residing in Eurasia for 100,000 years or more. It was only with the first greening after, around 70,000 years ago, that we had this cultural material that made us so successful. And when that desert turned green, we just took off. And that taking off of our species with that cultural uh, capacity is referred to as the great expansion. And so the idea is that between 170,000 years ago, that culture may have been most developed in Southern Africa. It then dispersed into East and Sub-Saharan Africa by 65 or so million, uh, thousand years ago. Once this de desert barrier was released, people from the Maghreb, people from Sub-Saharan Africa, they could have crossed over the land bridge. It appears that they did so sometime between 55 and 47. And by la greater than 46, they were already in Australia, okay? So incredibly rapid movement to the East. Uh, all the way to Australia, and that's where the Aborigines come from. Originally was that exodus that went all the way to Australia. Uh, they were in even northern Siberia between 45 and 32,000 years ago, and then eventually they got into Europe, but somewhat later, 46 to 40, probably because Europe was heavily occupied by the Neanderthals and they would have met with resistance. And they probably, uh, therefore, took longer, and it took a longer period of time for Homo sapiens, uh, or hunter-gatherers, as I'll call them, to displace the Neanderthals in Europe. Then they crossed over Beringia, which was the land bridge that existed again during the glacial. Uh, at about 26,000 years ago, this was all a land bridge. There was no sea there. Uh, and before the sea level rose back up during the end of the glacial, enough people crossed over 
that by 16,000 years ago that they entered into North America and they were at the far southern tip of South America 2,000 years later and 14,000 years ago. Uh, the Americas were completely virgin lands. No member of our species, our lineage, our homo lineage, as far as we know, had ever entered those two large continents ever before. So it took a long time, it was fairly recently that humans entered the Americas, but boy, when they did, they just spread like wildfire. Australia probably, well, Australia itself probably didn't have any of our relatives there, except Flores, the island Flores, where the hobbit lived, was right about there. And Java and those areas was, had Homo erectus in it before. Um, so um, there was, of course, a presence of our cousins evolving separately in Eurasia, but the Americas were completely hom hom homo free. I don't really have time to go through this. I cover all this as it is, so let's just go on with the pictures. Who was living in Eurasia at that time? Well, we know the Neanderthals were firmly entrenched in Europe. This is at the time of our exodus at, say, 70, but it would have applied also to the earlier exodus. Denisovans, which are known about only mostly from DNA, were thought to exist in Southeast Asia primarily, but they probably extended over into Siberia as well. So they would have covered this eastern part of Europe, Eurasia, and the Neanderthals were mostly in the west. Um, and we, as I mentioned, those groups that went over before the Neanderthals and the Denisovans went extinct, some of their DNA were incorporated into ours through intermingling, through having viable offspring. Now, the Denisovans and the Neanderthals, remember, probably both came from derivative, um, um, from Homo heidelbergensis. So when Homo heidelbergensis came over here earlier, and then we evolved separately in Africa, the whole meantime that we were evolving here, Neanderthals and Denisovans had evolved separately from the Homo heidelbergensis. And, um, so you had sort of two distinct species at least, maybe a third, and you may have had some Homo sapiens that had crossed over earlier and had survived, as I mentioned, since 120, 130,000 years ago. That's possible, but not very well confirmed. So it's possible that you had Neanderthals, Denisovans, anatomically modern humans, our species without hunter-gatherer cultures yet, and the Florensian hobbits. Those were probably all existing at that time in Eurasia when we crossed over. By the time we'd swept through there, none of those survived. They all went extinct. And then, of course, in the Americas, as I mentioned, there were none. There were no, no, one, no uh, relatives of ours. And as I said, some of us have some amount of, a significant amount of DNA from the Denisovans, but because that distribution is focused in this area, that's why they think the Denisovans were primarily living there at the time of this uh, great expansion. And I argue my book, I won't go through the details here, I just basically argue that the Sinai land bridge was probably the most likely crossing over point, simply because it's a lot easier to just walk across than it is to make a boat uh, essentially, crossing the Sinai didn't require any intention. Uh, if you're going to make a boat and cross over, you have to have intention. And it seems unlikely that that would have been true. And if you cross over the Sinai before, of course, the um, this is Suez Canal, that's 193 kilometers long. Um, you had this stretch of land here that people could have crossed over, but you cross over into an area that's extreme desert, the Negev Desert. They could have gone up along the coast, or they could have taken the somewhat more biblical route where they went down along the Gulf of Suez and then up through um, the Jordan Rift Valley, through the Dead Sea, and then up here. And you can see this area is quite habitable. This is quite severe. So once that crossing over occurred and the desert returned, there was no really going back. So this 
group of maybe 1,000 to 3,000, that was it, 1 to 3,000 uh, hunter-gatherer uh, homo sapiens crossed over at about 50, 60,000 years ago. And from that initial small leak of a couple thousand of us, boom, took off. And where'd they go? Well, the pathway out of the Levant, they could go north, of course, um, but the problem going north is you run into the Taurus Mountains and the Zagros Mountains, so those mountains probably funneled them east and, uh, and west. And east was probably easier based on the fact that they got to Australia greater than 46,000 years ago. That was very rapid that they moved east. West was more difficult, perhaps because the pathway up through to the Black Sea and up through the Danube River Valley was a lot less uh, straightforward, but also because these uh, Danube River Valleys presumably were heavily occupied by Neanderthals. So if they had tried to go this way, they probably would have met with resistance. This way, probably less so until they ran into the Denisovans further to the east. So this shows you this rapid coast potential southern coastal route that would have gotten them to Australasia. Now, they would have had to have made boats to cross over to Australia because even in the glacial maximum, although much of the peninsula is land, there is still water separating there. But the making of boats appears to have been happening then because they went to a couple other islands offshore that also required boats at about the same time. So the suggestion is that by this uh, stage, they would have been able to use boats, at least for minor crossings of relatively still ocean. They weren't yet ready to go to Hawaii, say. Way too far, in a way. That would only come later. And what happened is when they came, OK, this gives you a blow up of Wallacea. That's the archipelago here with all these islands. Here's Flores. Uh, here's Java. That's Timor. And there is evidence of eating deep sea fish at 42,000 years ago. So perhaps they had limited uh, boat activity. These are some old fish hooks they found. But once they crossed over to Australia, from all indications, they were the first of our homo lineage to arrive there. And they had a decimating impact on the megafauna in Australia. So you had things like these giant flightless birds. Here's a human. So these were like two meters high. Um, you had the um, marsupial lion. Uh, and you had the giant wombat. And these animals didn't really know what humans were. They certainly didn't know what these long sticks were with points on the end. And they were basically pretty easy to wipe out because these are pretty slow reproducing animals. So if you kill off, you don't have to kill off too many of them to basically cut their reproduction down very, very low, and they would have essentially gone extinct. And the extinction of most of these megafauna in Australia just so happens to coincide with the arrival of humans. So it's very suggestive that we were at fault. And as I mentioned, the movement into um, Europe was slower, came later and was slower. And you have a whole bunch of cultures associated with it, primarily because Europe's full of archaeologists and they all love that stuff there and they just study it to bits. So the amount of information in Europe is just overwhelming and I'm not going to overwhelm you with it. I'm just going to say you've got all sorts of cultures, Elusian, Proto-Ignatian, <laughs> Um, you have the um, Orignacian itself. You have other cultures in here. They all date from about 45, 46 is the earliest, right the way up through France and through to UK by 42,000. El Castillo Cave, I'll mention that, about 41,000. So that's sort of the trajectory of hunter-gatherer humans through this region. We know they were interbreeding with Neanderthals to some extent. But we also know that the Neanderthals eventually uh, went extinct. And of course, we're all pretty familiar with the amazing artifacts from Europe. Here's the, um, the classic Venus figurine uh, from Germany, the Swabian in Germany. Here's the uh, bone flute. Here are some um, antler uh, bone uh, points. And here's the lion man, famous lion man carving. And of course, the um, cave painting. 
But as I mentioned before, this sort of intense cultural 